Okay. Can everybody see this back again? Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Well. Yes. Okay. So good. good. Okay. Yeah. So we're back to Hampton Park. I'm just going to get off the screen now. Um, one thing I wanted to just mention about Hampton Park is in the southern woods, you will not find um, an evergreen or a conifer uh, cone bearing tree. And that is because it's incredibly wet. There are some years where it doesn't dry out until almost the end of June. So all of the uh, evergreens you're going to find it basically closer around this area. And this is where the old river shore escarpment would have been running through this area here. And then this is more of an uplands uh, drier area up, up above the ridge. Okay, so now we get to get into the, some of the fun starts. And this is what we've been doing over the last uh, year. And huge, huge shout out uh, to TreeFest Ottawa. Where do the tree with, comes oh. into, where does the, like the bipolar bisectomy really switch into like the different months and stuff? Like how does three work? Like if I'm trying to get one to one, like how do you get from four to two within one sentence? Uh, I'm sorry, Ron, what are you talking about? I, he's on a different Zoom and I just removed him. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. Adventures in, yeah. in Zoom. Thank you very much. Okay, so big shout out to TreeFest Ottawa because this year uh, we were, or rather last year, they got an Infrastructure Canada grant and with it they were able to hire uh, coordinators, me on a part-time basis and another one on the Gatineau side. And because we were able to sort of really focus our attention on Hampton and Carlington uh, for 10 full months, we were able to move a lot of things forward that we had already started and sort of set the groundwork for the next years with or without funding. So again, big shout out to TreeFest for that. And these are just some of the events uh, that we did. And these are the main ones. And then we're going to be getting into the actual projects in a second. So these are some of our partners and supporters. I apologize if I've missed anybody, um, but we either work on a project by project basis or you know, um, in some cases like the National Capital Commission, we have a, a land access permit with them. So anything we do, we sort of, uh, we talk to them about our plans and they say yay or nay, uh, give their feedback, et cetera. Um, I really can't say enough good things about Nepean High School. They have been a, such a solid partner for the last two years. They've grown plants, they've cleaned up trash, they've removed uh, invasives, they've done everything um, and more. We also have a partnership uh, burgeoning with the Ottawa Catholic School Board, and we hope to add St. Elizabeth's Elementary, which is on Coldry Avenue in Carlington, and Notre Dame High School, which is on Broadview, and that's on the Kitchissippi side. So we're hoping to work with them uh, later this year. So these are the big projects that we worked on. So um, we're going to start with Carlington first. So Nora, um, I may need you at some point. So be, uh, be ready uh, if I have to call on you. So we're going to start with the Clyde B and Butterfly Patch um, and some of the other things that are in Carlington. So again, here's another map. This is um, where the uh, Clyde B and Butterfly Patch is. So this is Clyde Avenue South and this is Castle Hill Crescent. So this is basically on the other side of where the staircase garden is um, and right behind the pollinator patch is where our buckthorn removal project is and we'll be talking about that one as well. So this is what the place looked like in 2019. Um, it was just an idea that Nora brought to the Friends of Carlington uh, Woods around the fall, I believe, August or September of 2019. And that's when we really started to get excited about it because we saw the potential that even though it wasn't in the Carlington Woods itself, it was on the roadside, we saw the potential to have a really good um, uh, impact on what's called the edge effect. And on the edges of woods, what typically happens, especially in urban forests where you have a lot of traffic, is you'll get new paths being made in, you'll get more trash, on the edges of the forest, not necessarily farther in. So when you get places looking a little nicer on the edges, it tends to make people a little bit more aware of their behaviors in general, maybe pick up a bit more trash. And it really seems to have proven itself as, uh, as being positive on those edge effects, because we are seeing less litter. So keep this 
uh, photograph in mind as we go to the next one, because this is what it looked like this summer. And it's a little bit of a tighter shot, but you can see the difference already. Now we still have a lot of uh, invasives in here um, at this stage. We have not removed the buckthorn at this point, particular time in place in this photograph. And there's still some sumac, which can be quite aggressive. But here's a few more of the, uh, the, the insects and even a little groundhog that occasionally stops by um, our lovely little patch. Nora has been, how often. <laughs> but yeah, well, and bunnies too. They're nibbling away on things, I'm sure. Nora's yeah. done a great job having an episode, um, you know, almost every month or every two months to sort of showcase what's going on and, and different things that are going on at the patch. Um, do I have another one? No. Okay, so that's the patch right here. I'll, I'm not going to set forth it back into the buckthorn yet. In case you wanted to mention anything, Nora, um, or well, anything. Just, had, yeah. One thing, actually, I went through in my mind and looked for evidence to realize that we really didn't actually start it until 2020. Okay. Yeah, I was a whole year out. <laughs> Okay, well, there you go. It was 2020. So, so we've had two full summers, two full seasons. Uh, right. Here. Okay. My miss. Okay, so I will correct that from, from the other one. And this, um, I guess the larger photo on the screen you have right now mm -hmm. is from this year. Yeah. yeah, that one's from this year. The one before, too, uh, this one is definitely from this year. Um, this is from July, I believe. So, yeah, that's possible. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, I don't remember. I mean, that's obviously a bumblebee on a New England aster. I think, do you know what that is? Is that a wasp of some kind or a beetle on I'm goldenrod? Sure. <laughs> yeah. <I'm sure> it <laughs> is. Yeah. But I think we've got what about 15, 20 different species in there now, maybe more? Of, of what? Of insects? Of, of, native, of native plants. Oh, yeah. we have something like 45 different. 45. Wow. Yeah, that I, I think we started with about um, four or five different species that were there already. Mm -hmm. So we've added a considerable number. Uh, I just counted up my my record from the fall. I did an inventory in October, and uh, there's a leaving out a few that I wasn't totally sure I was finding or not. Um, I, it came to forty five. Wow, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> and all of them are native. So uh, if you are looking for plants uh, to, you know, maybe grow yourself or have in your own garden, that's a really good spot to go and check it out. And Nora's do also done a really good job of labeling almost every plant. So you can see uh, the common and sometimes the scientific names too, I think. Yeah, yeah. sometimes. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes I put the scientific <laughs> name on the back. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Not every single plant is labeled, but we try to. Uh, I tried to sort of label most uh, different species, so you know you can look around and see what's there. I, I just find the pollinator garden, this the Clyde Bean butterfly patch, I, I think has been a really good ambassador for a lot of things. Um, so many people stop by, you know, anytime I'm there, somebody always usually stops and says something about it or wants to know what we're doing or, or whatever. So again, um, it's a really nice little, little area to go check out. And I would yeah. recommend if you haven't seen it to go to go and see it. So the Clyde Bee and Butterfly Patch was sort of a springboard for us to start the next thing, which was removing all of the buckthorn, which I had mentioned. So buckthorn and honeysuckle sort of dominated that area behind the fence of the Clyde Bee and Butterfly Patch. There is native species back there. There's common juniper. There's some smaller um, uh, herbaceous plants like goldenrods, asters, etc. We have some trees with there's some elms and uh, there's a mature oak. Uh, Burr Oak back there. Um, a few others. We walked with Owen Clarkin of the uh, Ottawa Field Naturalist Club a couple of weeks ago and he gave us a few more uh, trees that were in there. So with a $1,000 grant from the uh, Invasive Species uh, uh, Council, we got in there to remove about 90 square meters of invasive buckthorn and honeysuckle and replace it with native shrubs and trees. So here we've got 
whole bunch of us, you know, like basically taking out enormous, they're trees almost, these buckthorn shrubs, they can be 20, 30 feet uh, high. I think this is the one I took home. My husband is going to make some sort of a guitar stand out of it. Um, these are grade six students from Revel Academy uh, nearby over on La Perriere Street who were absolutely fantastic. They just uh, mucked right in, uh, got in there getting out the roots and cleaning up the trash and all the rest of it. And we bagged up, I think, something like 50 bags of, of stuff to take out and uh, it was all the invasive material. So it's not super impressive right now, but this is what it's going to what it, it will look like eventually. All of these shrubs have been numbered. We have two trees, the rest of them are all shrubs. So number 42, which is, if you've ever read um, Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, is the meaning of life, the universe and everything. And that's a butternut tree, which is an endangered species. And we have butternuts uh, in Carlington, so we wanted to plant another one. Um, number 24 is the other tree, and that's a black cherry tree, and that should also do reasonably well here. The other shrubs, we've got nanny berry, bladder nut, a couple of different kinds of dogwood. Um, do we have a pin cherry in there? No. No? What am I thinking? What am I forgetting? Oh, nine bark. I'm forgetting the nine bark. Yeah, nine bark for sure. So this was quite a job. Um, this was probably the hardest job that we've done so far in, in either park. Um, it took five days to clear this stuff. And you, I, unfortunately, I don't have a better shot of the extractigators, but these orange um, pieces of equipment uh, were loaned to us from the Fletcher Wildlife Garden. And basically, they rip the, you can sort of... Uh, attach them to the edge of a, of, a, of a root system and just yank it right out. Without those things, I think our, our time probably easily would have doubled. If we had to dig that stuff out, we needed a pickaxe to, to dig some of the holes um, just because there's so much rock in there. So it, it just thank, thankfully we were able to get those from Fletcher. Um, if we do double the size of the area, it's going to be behind where these already are. Um, we have asked, uh, we're going for a grant of a little bit more, and hopefully we'll be, be able to buy our own extractigators <laughs> so that we can lend them out to other people as well in the future. So that's the Buckthorn Project. And now we come on to the other uh, one in Carlington, which is the Staircase Garden. So Eileen, this is where we are. Yep. Um, so yeah, that big staircase, if for anybody who's unfamiliar with Carlington, this staircase takes you from LePage and McBride up to Edgecliff and Caldwell, uh, very close to the Edith Bide Daycare Center and the entrance into the Carlington Woods uh, off of the north set. Yes, that was I mean. McBride and? LePage. LePage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the so, Esther Bay, I think. It's Esther Bay, pardon me. Yeah. I, I Just, always say, yeah, okay. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. The Esther Bay daycare. So this is the staircase garden before. So this is early spring of last year. Um, and what we wanted to do here was it's not like there was anything really exciting going on here. It was mainly just some uh, grass, invasive, possibly native, we're not quite sure. But down this slope, traditionally were quite a number of native wildflowers, some, you know, some invasive, some non-native. And our idea was to sort of take off a little bit of this and sort of mimic a meadow slope. Also bringing in more pollinating plants, but the general idea was to sort of try to re-meadow this little slope and make it more, um, more of those sort of native grasses. So a lot of kids do still slide here. Um, but not as often uh, as they used to. So that's why we took over the, the, the farthest edge of it. So that's what it looked like before. And this is what it looks like when we first put it in this year, which was at the end of September. So have a nice little sign there. We've got some uh, New England asters. We're already nice and big and flowering. And the rest of them are smaller. They're harder to see, but there's a lot of uh, native grasses and some other native wildflowers in there. And then it's surrounded, this is all sumac, which we will have to, eh, we'll have to control because we'll have to sumac manage has, somehow. Yeah, we'll, we'll manage the sumac because that, it has a nasty habit of, you know, wandering into things. Um, and 
here's again the Revel Academy kids were fantastic up here too. Um, I think half of them went into the woods and cleaned up trash and I think they came out with about two bags of trash in an hour. Uh, we made short work of it up here and they had a great time. And even in the winter time, this was taken just a month or so ago, uh, we're protecting it from sliding. Um, we got some snow fencing from, from a volunteer and we put in another slide, just asking people not to slide through it. So that is the- yeah, They mostly would slide from the top of the edge, of course, yeah. not really over the garden, but to get to that, uh, to, to the edge of the hill. Right, exactly. <laughs> so have to walk across it, so. Yeah, like on this one, on the big one here, you'll see, you can kind of see a little bit that there's some, uh, this is where people tend to walk right near the staircase and they also mm. slide there, which is a bit dangerous because of those concrete footings on the staircase. But um, yeah, it's, very do, steep. it's quite steep. But of course we have the best ski hill of all time of in, in the entire city, just over here on this hill over here. <laughs> So I don't think we're taking anything away from people here um, and we're giving a lot back. So those are the Carlington projects and we're going to move on to Hampton unless anybody's got a question about these before we move on. But, you know, we can always come back to it uh, if we want to at the end. So Hampton, we've done uh, more uh, uh, more at. Um, it's a little bit easier to deal with um, uh, Hampton merely because the majority of it is owned by the NCC. So we only have to really deal with them. Uh, so there's a bunch of projects going on. So I'll start with the meadow. Um, Cause this is probably one of the ones that you can really see has changed the most. So this top one up here, um, we had a problem with dog strangling vine. And for people who don't know what that plant is, uh, it is a vine, but it mimics um, a common milkweed. So what happens is when monarch butterflies come along and they lay their eggs on it, when the caterpillars do come out and they wanna start feeding, there's nothing for them to eat. And dog strangling violin also tends to set up shop in the exact same spots as milkweed. So usually if you've got milkweed, take a look, you might also have dog strangling vine. It does look different, so you will be able to spot it. Um, but it can smother entire trees. Uh, at Fletcher Wildlife Garden, I saw it covering spruce trees. So it can grow uh, to the height of its environment. Generally speaking, it tends to creep over the ground. So in this case, in this part, portion of the meadow, it basically been, it was hiding under Virginia creeper. So I didn't catch it uh, right away, but we did catch it in time. So this patch we had cleared, you can see that bare patch in 2020. And then in 2021, we came in and we put in a few plants, so you can see them there. And then now we've got a real riot of color. So this was the plantings that we did uh, for, for this year, Joe Pieweed being the last one to go in. So this year, what we're doing, there's still dog strangling vine in there. You can't really dig that stuff out unless you've got a backhoe. Um, so we just have to keep weakening the system. So put a little burlap uh, around some of the plants this year. It won't suppress it, but it will be easier to spot it in the spring when we go and we, we take it out again. Now, along the ridge part, um, the ridge has eroded quite badly, and I'll show you some photographs later on of some of that. Um, but we've lost some, some trees as, uh, here as well. So this is a good opportunity for us to fill in uh, with some of these plants. There's a lot of bare areas that we can fill in. So this sugar maple was lost uh, four or five years ago in October 2018. And it seemed like a really good place to start putting in some of the ferns, um, some fall Solomon seal and some bloodroot. So we did a, a little tiny project here in 2021. And then we added a few more in 2022. And we started moving a little bit farther down the ridge. So here is a before picture, not very much here, pretty bare, still fairly bare, but put in about 10 ferns here. And I think there's another plant back here that was put in. Um, it might have been one of the dogwoods. We took possession of almost 250 tree seedlings from Ecology Ottawa's um, uh, surplus trees from their giveaways this year. And seven of us have divided them up and we're overwintering them. 
<clears throat> this raised bed container, I believe it's Christine Earnshaw's uh, with TreeFest Ottawa. And I think you've got at least 40 or 50 of them, Christine. Um, and so we're hoping that some of these trees are going to find their way into Hampton Park, particularly in these bare areas along the ridge and hopefully some into Carlington as well. Also along the ridge, uh, we've been working on knotweed. Knotweed is in about four or five different colonies uh, throughout the park, <clears throat> but these are the ones that are along the ridge. So this one up top is the same one as this down below. This is the same colony when it was here. This is a close-up. It's a bamboo-like uh, plant, so it's hollow in the middle. And when it first comes up in the spring, and it is one of the first plants to come up, very, very uh, aggressive. And it has these sort of pink nubs. They almost look like, well, they look a little rude. I always call them nipples, but that's exactly what they look like. And they'll come up beside old versions of the dog strangling vine, or dog strangling, not weed, pardon me. So we have cleared most of it. Um, the NCC is controlling <clears throat> um, some, of the, uh, con some of the colonies, which some people have seen. You'll notice the, there's signs like these in, in all of them. So they laid down geotextile like this, then they put um, a wood chips over top, and this will stay undercover for at least another year. It's been undercover now uh, since 2020, so we're into year three. Um, most of these colonies will have to stay covered uh, for at least another year or two. There's two exceptions to that, and these are the, the two. So the first one is at the Buell entrance of Hampton Park. <clears throat> so that's um, farther up. It's more into the, uh, the it's above the ridge. So behind this snow fencing in uh, 2021, is it 2021? Yes, in June, the NCC decided to uh, spray for glyphosate in this one particular knotweed colony, mainly because it was very, very small and it was, it was not an established colony. So they kind of wanted to do it as a control method to see how it would work against some of the other things that we were trying. So they did that in 2021, and that's allowed us to replant this year. So in, this, in the fall of 2022, so September, we put in uh, 30 shrubs and trees, uh, eight, black cherry trees. And again, that's a species that, that's here in the park. So really excited about that. And this will stay behind the fencing uh, for now to protect those trees. And hopefully, potentially, we may be also be able to fill this in with uh, some of the smaller plants. The other place where we're doing a little bit of regeneration in a knotweed colony is the one that the volunteers are controlling, which is the largest one. That is 1,200 square meters. Um, these two top pictures are before we cut down the regrowth from earlier this year. You can see how tall this is. These are uh, New England asters, um, and this is those are New England asters here. And this is the Japanese knotweed that basically comes and looms over top of it. It can grow to 20, 25 feet. So the only way to really deal with it without, again, a backhoe or chemicals is to cut it down and weaken the system by covering it. So that's what the Nepean High School students did uh, this year. We covered the entirety of, of the colony. We had only been able to cover a portion of it up until now. So all of the colony is now covered. We just have to continue to control it and weaken it. And what we've been doing here is as we're weakening it, we move some of these uh, tarps that are down. So on the slope that goes uh, by Island Park uh, Drive, the sidewalk, we've pulled these tarps down a little bit, whoops, pardon me, and we've put in plants. It's not a great uh, shot right here, but I hope to do that again this spring. We're gonna move this tarp down a wee bit more and put some more plants in behind here and just keep doing it. So this gives those native plants a chance to really, you know, get strong and combat uh, against the knotweed. We couldn't add more into this spot this year because when me and another volunteer went in to move the tarp, we discovered a small village of mice. So we gave them a break and said, well, you might get evicted in the spring, but for winter, you're, you're safe here. 
in 2021, we also piloted a trail system. We've had uh, some a lot of difficulty in Hampton and in Carlington, for that matter, with fort building and uh, trail making everywhere through the woods. So what we wanted to do was deconstruct one of the forts, which was what we did, and we used those uh, materials to make the, bound, the, the markers along uh, the ground, the sort of borders that you can see here. Unfortunately, this trail system didn't last very long. Um, we even had two Nepean high school students who redid uh, the markers later on in the year. Also, people took them down. So we have had some interest from the NCC to develop uh, an official trail system. So we hope in the future we can do that, but I think it was a good, it was a good exercise to do. Um, and I think most people still do stick to the trail, uh, but it does need to be official, I think, in order to, to protect a little bit more of the ecosystem here. The one that I didn't mention at the very beginning is the new Brennan Garden, which is at uh, one of the entrances to Hampton Park off of Island Park Drive. Um, we just prepared the ground. We did something similar in uh, at the staircase garden. Oh, we lost? Pardon me? We lost you, you for a little while. Oh, okay. Where did you lose me? Um, before you move to this slide, anyway. Okay. Just after you finish talking about um, the trail system. Okay. All right. So the Brennan Garden is one I didn't mention at, at the beginning. Um, this one is still up for grabs. So we're talking to uh, a few people, uh, might be the high school, might be another organization, it might be Friends of Hampton, but we're gonna design a very small little garden here, which is prepared. It's only 18 feet by 20, I believe, or 18 by 10. Um, Eileen and the Nepean High School students helped uh, cover it. So we're just gonna kill the grass underneath here. All that's under here is things like uh, garlic mustard, burdock, there's some poison ivy and, and just grass. So we're not taking anything away. Um, so this will be done in the spring of 2023. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to hear from anybody who might wanna do this one. Um, so that basically are the projects. I have a lot of before and after uh, photos, but if people do have questions or you wanna chat about anything in particular, uh, we can do that now. Um, or if Nora, if you wanted to add anything, or Christine, or no, anything right now. All right. Well, then we're just going to keep going, and I'll show you some more photo photographs here. Oh, William has his hand up. Oh, all right, William. Um, yeah. Hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, great. Okay. Um, hi, everybody, and thanks so much, Sharon, um, for this uh, great presentation and. Congratulations on all the neat stuff going on. Um, I guess like one question that I've got is like maybe um, zooming out a little bit. Mm. Um, so like, what are the lessons learned, so to speak? Or like, like what are the takeaways? Um, I guess I'm especially interested in, okay, I am, you know, uh, someone who's into, um, you know, this sort of stuff, planting native pollinator gardens and so forth in public spaces. Um, what's the low hanging fruit? Like what are the things, for example, that um, you could generalize from your experiences here um, that a person who hasn't done anything like this before um, would be surprised to know, you know, what, um, what are the opportunities um, that are, you know, untapped at the moment? I, I don't know if that's um, too vague of a question, but I'd, I'd love to hear your, your thoughts on you know, what a person um, in that position that I described should take away from this? Well, I, 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 the thing that immediately jumps to mind, if, if you know nothing about plants, but you sort of know what you like, you probably know more plants than you think you do. So even just to get, you know, even just going online and just checking out what is that thing in your yard? Right? So maybe the one in your yard, like a lot of people are surprised by what's native and what isn't or what's what they think of as ugly and what what isn't so I don't know um for somebody I guess I'm more interested mm. in, in the aspect of like sort of community organizing and mm. using public lands and stuff like that like um what are the lessons to be learned from that standpoint okay well patience number one depending on the land that you're dealing with okay so we we dealt with both the city and the NCC um, it's taken us a while to get uh, to a relationship with the NCC, but now we have a land access permit, which is much easier. At this point, all we, they trust us. 
We always vet our plant lists and our, 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 our projects through them, but they basically just rubber stamp us. The city is more difficult because there are multiple departments. So um, when it comes to the city, if you want a lesson learned from a community organizer uh, perspective, go to your counselor first. Go to your counselor first. Do not go to parks, don't go to facilities, don't go to any particular department because you will be, there's various departments you may end up having to work with. I counted up for the Clyde Bee and Butterfly Patch, we worked with at least six or seven different departments. So that's a lot of people. Um, and if you're a volunteer, that can be incredibly confusing um, if you don't know anything about the way the city works. So yeah, that would be a huge lesson learned. If you want to do this on public land, talk to your counselor first. <laughs> Nora, what about you? I think you probably uh, might have something to add here. Yeah, I think um, if you can get your counselor on your side or if they are you know, keen, uh, they'll be a great asset. Well, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully they will be more than just, yeah, that's a great idea. Go ahead or something. In, in our case with Riley Brockington, he was um, quite proactive and, you know, encouraging. So it was even better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think, I think what we've found with <clears throat> having uh, community interest too, it, it takes uh you know, people are interested and you want to encourage that, but you also um, can't expect as many people coming out as you might hope. <laughs> this is uh, when, when another lesson learned, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know what, I, I, off the top of my head, I haven't got another thought yet. <laughs> you, you did remind me of something though, Nora, and something that, that we've talked about. It's just like, don't take on more than, than, one or two people can actually do. Like if you only got a core, small core group of, you know, two or three people, do not take on something that needs 10 and think that you can find seven more people, right? <laughs> so try and keep your expectations as to something that you can handle and something that you can handle over the long term because putting in a pollinator garden is not a one year uh, project. It's a minimum two, three, four to get it established. And then you probably will still need to maintain it, you know, for uh, at least, you know, a few hours um, a month, you know, usually uh, every year. Um, but yeah, so, you know, be prepared to spend a little bit of time. Um, most pollinator gardens, yeah, you can get them established fairly quickly, but they do need a little bit of babying, a little bit of pampering at the very beginning. So, yeah, I guess another thing to add might be that there are other people doing this sort of thing. Uh, so not to assume there's no other resources than your own, <laughs> your own ideas and, and desires. Uh, uh, I had pointed out before the wild, wild pollinator partners, mm -hmm. um, which is an offshoot really in a way of the field, um, Fletcher Wildlife Garden, I guess. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and there are other organizations and groups that are also involved. So definitely look around. And that I mentioned Wild Pollinator Partners because they do have a pretty good um, reference list of other pollinator uh, gardens in the city mm -hmm. and access to to the contacts for them. So it's a it's a way of uh, you know uh, making your network bigger. And I believe, Christine, correct me if I'm wrong, is there not something, some movement afoot to do like another garden tour next year? Yeah, the, the Wild Pollinator Partner is going to set up garden tours starting in the springtime and okay. in the summer. So for on-site visits open to the network mm -hmm. to meet on-site to go over uh, sort of the history of the site and the community partnerships around the site. And so it's just gonna be a learning opportunity, a really nice time to be spending in different gardens, in different parts of the cities, uh, embedded in different communities, but also as a learning opportunity and to look at uh, the city as a whole. So the citywide network and how it is um, the patches of these pollinator gardens and sort of seeing where they exist and where there are gaps and how we can continue to work together. That's but I was going to say about Hampton, mm -hmm. like one of the lessons, or Carlington too, but it's always 
good to look around the community and leverage the resources that are there. And I think one thing Sharon in particular has been very um, critical in doing is the, the partnerships with schools. Schools have these kids that are <laughs> involved with learning um, curriculum, but it's also the teachers. So you need the teachers on board, but the kids are, are gung-ho to do this. And in the case of Nepean, they are growing plants from seed. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge stock that's that's valuable in terms of their learning, but it's a valuable resource to have in the community. So I think it's just being um, open to really understanding what the resource is, what the skills, the expertise is right around the neighborhood yeah. and, and seeing what can be leveraged and hopefully over time to not just one offs, but um, a continued source of stewardship around that particular site. Yeah, well said. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask. Don't reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of us who have done some of the hard work. Don't reinvent the wheel. You know, like, don't worry. Like, call one of us. We're more than happy. A lot of us are more than happy to, to, to chat about our projects. So, yeah. Perhaps one other thing to add is that although the city um, purportedly is keen on pollinator gardens, it, they're not quite as ready to um, to really support them as they as you might hope. <laughs> Just yeah. kind of a sad thing to say, but um, yeah. I don't know. I guess with with some new people in council and so on, maybe we'll see some changes there. I think we could we could certainly follow up with our councillors to try and, mm -hmm. especially their new ones, to sort yeah. of further encourage. Um, awareness and implementation of um, of like the ways uh, we the city manages any green space even if it's like roadsides and uh, so on as well as parks and so on that uh, there could be ways to do it that are more more uh, supportive of of the wildlife that we want to we want to maintain yeah there was some movement afoot from the city. They were talking about trying to streamline um, requests like this. Uh, it was a conversation I had with somebody in the finance department because they they started wondering, why are we getting all of these requests for permissions to do pollinator gardens? So that was from the finance department. So that was you know, last March, I believe I had that conversation. So it's on their radar. They understand that that you know there's there's groups that want to do this, but it's you know I don't know where that process uh, is. But William, the other thing that you know um, William had had raised that question, and he's with Ecology Ottawa, and they're doing a pollinator um, project uh, this year. One thing I'm kind of interested in, and and is sort of the connections were the green corridors within the city, and when you see those big maps of of the city maybe there's a way to sort of strategically start looking at where we need to put in the pollinator gardens of the future um, to, to sort of fill in those corridors. I noticed something's in the chat here. That seems like a carryover from... No, this else. is... Uh, this was Jake. Um, Jake's... Uh, yeah, so if anybody uh, is looking in the chat, Jake Cole has just uh, mentioned something. Jake is with uh, the Sierra Club and the Breathe Easy campaign. So he's got an instrument that is measuring radiation from cell phones and cell towers. Oh. So I may be working with him on a little bit of a project we're going to meet on Monday. Um, but if anybody's interested, Jake is, uh, is in the chat, so you can always chat with him there. Um, Angela, you have your hand up. Hi, yeah, just uh, sort of, sorry, I was late, late oh, arriving. Yeah, no worries. Um, so sort of dovetailing with uh, what William's question was uh, unearthing. Um, do you guys know what's coming up? What, like there was, I think it was the transportation committee that was going to be looking at that issue of the boulevard strips and whether people could plant like plants and vegetables instead of grass um, and whether like the bylaw could be amended to um, enable that. Do you know what the follow-up on that is anybody? Yeah I don't. Does anybody else? 
I know growing food is a real that oh the city is really really hard on when you want to try and do a community vegetable garden very difficult my understanding um I was chatting with Marianne Marianne from uh four kids about this and my understanding is that it's um, being studied by the um city at the moment and they're going to come back uh I think some at some point this year um I think it was Transportation Committee, Angela, that um, was, you know, uh, took a look at it and, and seemed uh, enthusiastically supportive. Um, so, yeah, my, my understanding is that um, it's with the city at the moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They've certainly okay. been, they've been greening up some of the medians, for sure. They've been treeing the medians as well, certainly along Carling Avenue. Um, they've been doing that. Really? Yeah, in the case of our, mm -hmm. the Clyde Bee and Butterfly Patch, you know, in the agreement that we had, we signed with the city, um, we weren't allowed to put, to grow any uh, food plants. Yeah. And I mean, my understanding has been that it's, uh, you know, they're concerned about contamination from exhaust and so on. I, I think there was this the story that the cities had covered where I think it was a lady in Orleans who had been like growing like a, beautiful flower garden and like nurturing it and deriving joy and pleasure from it for mm. many years and then someone complained and the way the bylaw is enforced is on a sort of complaints basis yeah um so then it hit the newspaper and it's just kind of like ridiculous um so i i guess related to that i like a lot of what i think is is officially talked about as a native pollinator species i mean a, a lot of these guys are just like weeds that thrive um <laughs> and that that can actually like kind of like i mean milkweed is is like it is a weed right well um, hang on a second because a weed all a weed is is an unwanted plant that's the very simple definition of a weed so I like dandelions. I use dandelions. It's a wanted plant. It's not a weed. Okay. So, so it, it's sure. all the, yeah. <laughs> what I'm keen on is distinction between uh, non-native and invasive and non-native and naturalized. Keep right. that in mind too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But like I'm I'm kind of thinking like if we want to get going on some things and we figure out which plants are more resilient and then just basically do some guerrilla gardening yeah. on on public spaces which William I guess you can't officially start like you know doing web posts on you know we're meeting at like midnight here or there <laughs> but uh, I mean I, I know that in my neighborhood like along the Queensway um, people before had like planted uh, lilies um, and like all kinds of things that that will basically then like survive without um, you know someone with a watering can coming along and, yeah. and uh, doing that. Oh, kind of I think I think we should also distinguish, and you, you probably are aware of this, but that um, I mean a lot of the weeds <laughs> are the non-natives. Like there's a, they've tended to outcompete native plantings partly because of um, human activity, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, in removing the, you know, making it hard for the, the natives to, to grow. Um, so, and why, you know, why are we concerned that we have native plants? It's because they are, um, well, they, because of their relationship with native insects, I guess, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, you know, we want to encourage those that are, you know, it's funny, I was going to say that they're better adapted. Well, the weeds are pretty adapted. Um, you, you know, they're, as you say, they've become, a lot of them become naturalized or are invading. So they're, they're obviously able to, to live in our, our environment, but we, we'd rather not uh, eliminate, you know, or, or we'd, lo we'd rather have um, the, the greater biodiversity that we would have if we weren't being outcompeted by those um, those invasives. 
But even some of the natives, like uh, uh, weirdly enough, um, we've actually been asked by the NCC not to plant any common milkweed in Hampton. We have enough of it already in Hampton Park. And it is one of those plants that it's just like, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> thriving, you know, but that, I mean, it's good because that's a message that the Can Canadian public got. We got that message that monarchs are in trouble. This is what we can do. So, right. you know, Williams, uh, you know, question about a lesson learned. Sometimes we need it, you know, charismatic megafauna uh, is, is there for a reason. So sometimes, you know, when we love a, an insect or a plant or an animal so much that we, we got that message, we got it a little bit too much, right? So now there's milkweed everywhere. And like I said, the NCC has specifically asked us, do not grow any it's just like no we're not it's reseeding on its own very well thank you very much <laughs> yeah but no I mean I think I think there should be more um more greening of the medians um almost every other city I go to I see beautiful flowers and and stuff on the medians I don't care if they're they're you know I don't care if they're dandelions <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, it is true. By law, unfortunately, you can literally you can call it by law and say, hey, I don't like the grass is too high. And they'll go and they'll mow based on one person's, you know, call. Um, so is anybody aware of um, uh, of any like possible opportunities um, for pursuing exactly that, um, even just to get the city to stop um, mowing? You know, um, especially in like the clover leaves, mm -hmm. but yeah, medians like carling. Um, like, is there an obvious path forward or next few steps or something to pursue that? Does anybody know? Actually, I do know something about yeah. uh, the. I talked to a couple of people at the Ottawa Wildflower Seed Library, uh, one of their um, seed giveaways or exchanges as they call them. And um, they were saying that actually they have already met once this past year with some of the counselors and they were planning to meet again in January, I think, uh, to talk about mowing and whether there was, uh, you know, they could persuade them or inform them better, you know, about the advantages of maybe not mowing quite as often. And, that's all I know though. <laughs> and I mean we've we've put it um I, I put it very very directly to the land manager at the NCC. Um in the case of Hampton in particular, because the city manages the entire park and the maintenance is very up and down. Um it really depends on which crew is there, if it's a city crew or a contracted crew. Um, and, you know, I've, I've told the NCC, it's like, well, this is your contract. This is, you, these are your lands. They're not being maintained to a standard that, you know, is sustainable. So I'm trying to get the NCC to at least look at that contract, um, you know, and see if there can be some training for, for crews. We have ideas on how we can do this under sort of a shared management, but everybody's got to be on the same sort of page. And for my money, I think it's it's a question of training um, staff to recognize, you know, like a best practices, recognizing poison, poison plants, um, invasive plants, that kind of thing. But yeah, I mean, it, maintenance is a huge issue and it needs the city and the NCC and groups to sit down and chat with it. I'm so happy to hear that the pollinators uh, group is sort of taking that by the horns. All right. Well, I went back through some of my old photographs. We're at a little bit of a lull here. I think, I don't know what time it is, but, um, oh, it's 8.25. <laughs> We're coming up <laughs> on the end. So if, if everybody wants, I'll just quickly go through some of these. These are just before and after shots from various other years. I thought people might be interested in some of them. Um, so Here's the Carlington Meadow uh, before the pump track was put in. I don't know if anybody remembers this. I sure, I sure do. So, um, and here is while it was being built, and then when it was open, kids are are biking on it. And uh, you know, I'm not going to 
really say anything about about these things. No judgment here. It's just the way things are, uh, the way life goes sometimes. Um, in Carlington, we had a lot of trouble with uh, with the pump truck. We had some some uh, negative impacts because of it. So we got you know sod was cut out of the big uh, toboggan hill right here to make uh, a jump for for bikers. Here again, a berm, this is, it's hard to see, but this is about three or four feet of, of uh, sod that was basically cut out. Um, even in winter time, people will be cutting. Um, they're cutting buckthorn, but which is fine to clear sight lines, but unfortunately, whoever's been doing it has been leaving all the berries uh, behind. So it's just gonna get spread. Um, a note on that too, in Carlington, if anybody you see uh, cutting anything in the woods, ask to see a permit, because uh, they're not allowed to do it. And if they tell you that they're um, a volunteer with the NCC or they're doing work on behalf of the NCC, um, ask for their ID and a permit. Um, trash is a never ending story in Carlington, as most of us know. Um, the, the biggest thing for me is, is the hazardous waste uh, that we find a lot. Um, oil, needles, fireworks that are not even spent yet. Um, one of our volunteers picked up 200 beer cans in a single day, which was quite the, quite the nice little deposit into our bank account that day. Um, we have problem with illegal fire pits as well. Uh, Erica, uh, bless her heart, she mapped every single one that she could find and we've shared those with the emergency services uh, with Ottawa. Um, it's, a, it's a big, it, it worries me about Carlington and the fire risks there because it is, it does dry out very quickly. Um, forts, again, this top one is from 2001. This is the, the big fort. Uh, bent over by the ice storm. And this is the fort today. This is the same tree, but from this angle, I'm standing uh, at the back of it. It's a nice little bench in there if you want to go and have a little hangout. Um, this is where the ash trees were in 2015 in Hampton Park. So we lost about 400 of them. Um, and this is where some trees are going to be planted in 2023. We're finally getting them back in. So here's some of the re replacements that were done uh, the following year after they were first taken out. Most of them are doing okay. Some of the little ones that they put in <clears throat> because these evergreens are on, are, are on the edges. So these ones are still alive. Um, an Eastern white pine that came down uh, in April. Now, I don't, some of you may have noticed that some of the stumps are missing uh, from Hampton Park and the city took those out uh, for operational safety. So we're talking about maintenance and that seems to be a bit suspect to me. Um, these are some of the holes that uh, get dug in both parks uh, to give you a better idea of this one. This is a five-year-old boy in this. And so he's, you know, he's a good size for a five-year-old boy, but that was a, a hole that was dug in the Hampton Park woods. And the, uh, all of the soil put up on either side so that they can uh, jump their bikes over them. And I talked about how badly the ridge uh, has, has eroded over the years um, and why we, want, we need to regenerate this area in particular. So um, this beach stump, was uh, up for several years. It finally came down, here it is. This large hole here continues to widen uh, every time it rains uh, or another dog gets in there and starts digging. So we've tried to block it off. We're trying to work with the city <coughs> on a solution here as well, uh, but nothing yet um, that we can really announce. <clears throat> Again, this is the, from 2017. This is just as you're entering the southern woods of Hampton Park. Uh, there was a tree down six years later and it doesn't look a whole heck of a lot different and the trees down are still there. So uh, this is a squirrel study that was done in 2017. Now I'm not sure because I cut the, sh the shot off but I'm pretty sure this tree was already down but the tree is still here and that's what it looks like today. I literally took these two a day or two ago. 
Um, at the back of the park, when you come in on the city side um, or the playground side, <clears throat> if you walk down the lane, there used to be a couple of houses here with 12 mature trees on it. Every single tree on the property came down, except for the yellow birch, which is on the city side. It is the only one left. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it. Um, the, the, uh, the new building here is quite close to it. Uh, but the parking will be not at the back. Originally, the parking for this was supposed to be at the back and it was, it was changed. And I think this might be our last shot. This is the beech tree, uh, which has taken a bit of a beating um, over the last few years. So it lost this one before April of 2019, and this branch is the one that's gone now. Oh, I'm not even going to bother with that one. So I am done with all of the photographs, and it is 8.30. I promised an, an hour long. Um, does anybody have any final questions, or, or you know, did we hit on anything that you'd like to chat more about next time? I guess not. <laughs> Does anybody want to see any photographs before I stop sharing this? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone some good thank you yeah thank some good you. chats there so this is being recorded like i said so it will be up on on the website at some point so hopefully other people will come and, and take a look at it and uh yeah just thanks everybody for for coming on well thank you for all of your efforts all of you that was a great presentation <laughs>